Okay, perfect. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, stay that close though. Oh, okay, well, let me put my, <coughs> my laptop a little bit closer. Okay, does this help? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for, uh, for having me here. And um, well, I think it's a really great initiative um, in, in, in these strange times, actually. Um, but okay. Um, so my name is Jens Posma, and I'm a PhD candidate at the laboratory of Professor Hubert and Kater and Dr. Henry Sprung in Maastricht University. Um, and I work at the Department of Biochemistry. And our lab is actually focused on thrombosis. Um, and during my PhD pro project, I have actually been looking at how coagulation uh, plays a role in the development of several cardiovascular diseases. And that's actually what I want to show you today. <clears throat> okay, so I already told you that we're a coagulation lab. So that's, of course, also why I put coagulation in the middle. Um, because from a coagulation perspective, we actually look at atherosclerosis, we look at atrial fibrillation, and during my PhD project, I have also been looking at myocardial infarction. And that's also where I'm going to talk about today. Um, it, I will first quickly um, uh, give you uh, an overview of acute coronary syndrome and atherosclerosis. And then I'll go um, into some animal work where we look at how coagulation is involved in the development of atherosclerosis, um, but also myocardial ischemia, and in the end, a, a small part uh, about atrial fibrillation. Um, and then I end with um, the question whether these models that we use are actually translatable. And do we have any evidence in, for example, human trials where we indeed see that uh, the coagulation cascade um, does influence these, these cardiovascular diseases. And, um, well, let's find out. Okay, so acute coronary syndrome is, is, is really relevant because almost seven and a half million deaths are caused by coronary, coronary heart diseases worldwide per year. And this number is actually expected to rise significantly within the next decade. Um, and atherothrombosis is actually the underlying cause of these acute coronary syndromes. So here on the left, you see the LED uh, vessel, um, which actually uh, has plaque built up towards the lumen and thereby slowly occluding the vessel. Um, and in a later stage of atherosclerosis, this plaque gets uh, destabilized and it is prone to rupture. And that's what you see here. And this rupture causes an atherothrombosis on top of the plaque. And that um, represents itself as an acute coronary syndrome, um, a myocardial infarction in this case. Um, and that can, of course, also happen in the brain where it can lead to a stroke, an ischemic stroke. Okay. So just briefly, atherothrombosis. Um, so atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the vessel wall. And it starts with uh, endothelial dysfunction, uh, lipid, retention, lipid retention in the vessel wall, um, macrophages migrate towards uh, the vessel wall where they start to pick up um, these LDL, these oxidized LDL particles. However, they can, they can just not cope with the amount of LDL that they encounter. So they slowly turn into foam cells. And that's actually what you see here. And that drives slowly uh, the plaque uh, towards the lumen. Um, and in the later stage, I've already mentioned this, this plaque is prone to rupture, thereby uh, releasing this highly procoagulant um, um, content of the plaque with lots of tissue factor uh, that actually drives thrombosis. So this, this plaque content activates platelets, it activates the coagulation cascade, and you end up with an atherothrombosis. Um, and I already mentioned this, um, that atherosclerosis is an inflammatory disease of the vessel wall, um, but also thrombus formation occurs. And interestingly, actually, is that there's a tight link or, or a connection between the throm thrombus, uh, between coagulation, so the thrombus pathway, and inflammation, so they interact with each other. And this is just an example, but there are, of course, more interactions 
So what you see here in this picture on the left side, you see the coagulation cascade with the contact activation, so the intrinsic pathway, and you see the tissue factor pathway that in the end, um, both activate factor 10A into thrombin, the main enzyme of the coagulation cascade. And this thrombin is then able to cleave fibrinogen into the insoluble form fibrin that aids in clot stabilization. However, thrombin is not only to act to cleave fibrinogen, as you can see here with this arrow, it can also activate the complement system. So it can activate inflammation directly. Um, but that also goes the other way around. So here you see again the complement system and you see all these nice arrows indeed from C3, C5 going back to in this case, tissue factor on leukocytes. So it enhances the expression of tissue factor, which is the main trigger of the extrinsic cascade of coagulation. So this is a nice bridge uh, between inflammation and coagulation. And just a little bit off topic, uh, but still a hot topic at the moment because everyone is looking at corona at the moment. Um, and we have some evidence in the lab that in these corona patients, uh, the level C3 and C5 are ridiculously high. And that could potentially also explain why these patients are so thrombogenic um, because of this interaction. Um, but of course, that goes beyond the topic of my presentation. Um, so this is just an example, again, how the coagulation cascade influences uh, thrombosis, but also the other way around. But it's not the only example. And let's talk about that um, in the upcoming slides. Okay, so just briefly going back to uh, the clotting factors. Um, this work has been done by a PhD student some 10 years ago in our group, and he actually looked at the presence of clotting factors inside early and advanced atherosclerotic lesions. And this is, this is a, a very busy scheme, but what you should appreciate here is that um, all these clotting factors are actually present as well in early, but also in advanced atherosclerotic lesions. And then of course, you, you, this raises questions because what are they doing there? Do you need co coagulation inside your vessel? Um, or do they, do they do something else? Is it maybe a signaling function? And is it leakage from inside the vessel, uh, from the lumen, or is it maybe local production? Well, we know for example that factor 10A or factor 10 is being produced by macrophages. And of course, this is a platelet oriented uh, meeting. And we also know that platelets, for example, have, have uh, a lot of factor five. Um, so it can be either leakage or local production. We don't know that. <clears throat> but at least they probably have a function. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Um, and that was actually, together with some other papers, the basis for our uh, hypotheses. Because of course, we're looking at coagulation and how does it affect cardiovascular disease? And this is actually another way of a link between inflammation and coagulation. Uh, so what you see here in the blue part, you see again, a simplified scheme of the coagulation cascade, where you see tissue factor, factor 7a complex that activates your factor 10 into factor 10a. And this complex then activates thrombin, as I mentioned, the main driver of um, um, fiber information, or the main protease that, that cleaves fibrinogen into fiber. Um, but what you also see is that thrombin also, also activates platelets. Um, and in the end, by doing so, uh, when platelets get activated, they release tons of cytokines and inflammatory, pro-inflammatory mediators. Um, so through this, this, this loop via platelets, the coagulation system can also lead to a pro-inflammatory phenotype. But we also know that, for example, uh, the fiber and degradation products lead to inflammation. Um, so it's not only the platelet. And then here on the bottom, and that's actually where we're going to focus on today, um, you also see protease activated receptors. Again, this is a simplified scheme. On the next slide, you will see that we have a little bit more than two uh, protease activated receptors. But it's a G coupled protein receptor present on multiple cell types involved in atherosclerosis. Um, and the proteases of the coagulation cascade are also able to activate these receptors. Uh, for example, uh, factor 10A is the main activator of PAR2. And by activating PAR2, it also leads to inflammation. Just like thrombin, when it activates PAR1, um, can also lead to infl inflammation. 
Um, and I must say also PAR1 is of course present on platelets and that's how thrombin activates our platelets. <clears throat> And as I mentioned, we have not only two at the moment, we have four known protease activated receptors. And they can all be activated by proteases of the coagulation cascade. Of course, um, each having their own specificity. Um, <clears throat> for example, thrombin is the main activator of PA1, 3, and 4, um, while 4 to a lesser extent uh, than, for example, PA1, because PA1 has a high root and like sequence, a kind of um, increases the affinity of thrombin for PA1. Um, and also factor 10A, which is the main receptor of PAR2, which I've just mentioned, um, is highly relevant in terms of inflammation. Um, but you can see, uh, what you can also appreciate from this figure is that these protease activated receptors are present on multiple cell types that are involved in cardiovascular diseases. And the telial cells, leukocytes, uh, but of course also vascular smooth muscle cells and platelets. Um, and by activating these receptors, they can not only promote inflammation, but they're also involved in apoptosis, in angiogenesis, for example, um, and remodeling processes inside the vasculature. <clears throat> okay. So, so far, uh, my introduction. Um, let, let's, let's go into some, some data. Um, so we're, we're going to start off with some uh, animal work um, in the field of atherosclerosis. So this is actually, these are the two models that we, we actually currently use. It's a 14-week model, uh, APOE mice, APOE knockout mice prone to develop uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, it's a 14-week model and a 20-week model. In our 14-week model, um, in this case, um, we started off with either a Western-type diet or a Western-type diet supplemented with rivaroxaban. And rivaroxaban is a factor 10A inhibitor, so it's an anticoagulant. <clears throat> uh, 1.2 milligram per gram in the chow, and that corresponds roughly to uh, plasma levels as what in which we see in, in, in humans. So after 14 weeks, um, either Western type diet or treatment, we have our readouts, um, um, we look at plaque formation, we look at inflammation, etc. But what I think is even a, a more interesting model is our 20 week model because that actually is, is, is better in the translation to the human situation. Because what, what, do, what are we doing here? Well, in the first 14 weeks, both groups receive just a regular Western type diet. So they develop massive amounts of plaque in the aorta, in the carotids. Um, they develop massive amounts of, of atherosclerosis. Um, and after 14 weeks, we switch one group to rivaroxaban treatment for an additional six weeks and then we have a readout um, and before i go to the results um, we assume in interpreting in er, interpreting this model that all the mice that are switched to rivaroxaban at this time point are similar in plaque formation as these mice because also these mice have a 14 weeks western type diet <clears throat> Okay, so let's see what happens um, between the rivaroxaban treated mice and their controls. So let's start off here with the left part, where you see in the y-axis the stenosis in the carotids. Um, and what you actually can appreciate from this scheme is that in the control group, without any treatment, there's almost 100% stenosis in the carotids. Um, I mean, I even wonder why they were still walking around, but. Um, almost 100% stenosis. However, when we then treat these mice with rivrox band from scratch, we attenuated the plaque formation in the carotids towards roughly 75%. So that's a, a nice decrease of factor 10A inhibition. <clears throat> and I must say we also have these results in the aortic arch, um, but I haven't, I haven't show, I will, I won't show you that data here. Um, but you can of course also read it in the paper. Um, and what's even more interestingly, if we look at our 20 weeks model, um, we see that of course in our, in our control group, um, the stenosis actually stays the same. So nothing happens with the degree of stenosis in our 20 week control model. However, if we then assume that this group, the rivaroxaban treated group 
starts off at 100% stenosis. We might even speak about regression of plaque formation inside, or regression of plaques inside the carotids of these mice. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, I must say, we also looked for this in the aortic arch. Um, a similar trend was visible, um, but we probably lacked enough power to get that significant. Um, but it, it, it's not the only thing Revroxaban does. We also looked at um, fibrotic mark of, um, uh, markers for plaque stability. And to our surprise, we also found that Revroxaban treatments, so fact that TNA inhibition, also um, promotes a more stable phenotype in the plaque. And this was um, um, being visualized with markers for stability, uh, so alpha SMA, uh, collagen, and the fibrotic cap thickness. <clears throat> and it's always nice when um, people confirm this. And that has been done. Um, so this is from a review paper that um, I wrote in Chapel Hill together with uh, Professor Nigel Mackman. And here we looked at uh, animal models that either use Revroxaban or the bigger tran, which is a thrombin inhibitor. And in this case, we looked at how does it influence atherosclerosis. And what all these studies actually have in common is that they reduce plaque formation when you treat these mice with Revroxaban. Um, and most of these studies, um, definitely when you go a little bit higher in your concentration of Revroxaban, also saw uh, beneficial effects on plaque stability. And I also spoke about um, the link between inflammation and coagulation. And interestingly, what all these studies also showed is that when you treat these mice with an anticoagulant, inflammation goes down. Um, does this prove our hypotheses? Definitely not, because I also showed you that a lot of roots actually go to inflammation when you look at coagulation, and that was just a simplified scheme. But it's at least good that other people also confirmed what we see in our Revoxaban treated mice. <coughs> I'm sorry. So um, what kind of markers are we then talking about if we look at inflammation, for example? Let me give you two examples. This is from a horror paper um, where you, <coughs> I'm sorry. So this is also from an APOE knockout model, uh, uh, mice treated with Revroxaban, and they looked uh, locally at markers for inflammation um, on the left messenger RNA. And what they are indeed also show that when you treat these mice, you decrease the amount of inflammation inside the aorta. Um, then they turned it around, they looked at peritoneal macrophages that they treated with factor 10A, and they show, and they indeed found an increase of inflammatory markers like MCP1, IL-1 beta, and of course also TNF-alpha, um, that they were able to inhibit with Revroxaban, and that just shows that there's no contamination, uh, for example, with LPS. <clears throat> so this really shows that factor 10A does the trick here on these macrophages. So definitely, again, a link between inflammation and uh, thrombosis, at least coagulation. Um, but this is just locally. And atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. So would factor 10A inhibition also be able to um, inhibit um, inflammation systemically? Well, um, let's go a little bit off topic here, because this is a mouse model um, for sickle cell disease. And in, this, in, in these mice, um, they, also treated, or they also treated these mice with uh, Revroxaban, but also with the bigger tran. And what they found with Revroxaban treatment is indeed that plasma levels of IL-6 in this case went down. Also suggesting indeed that Revroxaban can not only inhibit inflammation locally, but also systemically. Okay, now, let, now let's go back to the figure. <clears throat> Um, so what I've showed you is just a few studies about factor 10A inhibition and atherosclerosis. So what you actually see is we inhibit our system at this level, but you see that a lot of downstream effectors can all lead to inflammation. So if we, re if we really want to prove that it's part one or part two, or maybe even the platelets or thrombin that's doing it, we have to dig deeper. 
And a few others have already looked at part one and part two knockouts. <coughs> and interestingly, um, more pronounced in the part two uh, models, uh, deficient models, they actually found similar results as we, but also others see with rivaroxaban uh, treatment. So atherogenesis goes down um, and inflammation goes down. Part one is a little bit controversial in, 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 with this respect. Um, but definitely in our part two models, we see a consistent decrease of um, plaque formation and inflammation. So does this now prove um, that coagulation and inflammation um, are uh, related through or modulate each other through part one? No, actually it doesn't. Um, this is a very old table already from 2005. Um, so it definitely needs some updating um, also in my presentation. Um, but what you can appreciate here is that not only proteases of the coagulation cascade um, are able to activate PAR receptors, also multiple other proteases, uh, for example, catepsin G, plasmin, um, they can either inactivate or activate um, your receptor. So we actually don't know in these mouse models where we knock out our PAR1 or PAR2, whether it's indeed the coagulation cascade that now does the trick. Because it can also be a different protease that is not able to activate your receptor anymore, which causes your phenotype. Um, and today, at, at this moment actually, no one has looked at, for example, PAR mutants who are resistant to specifically one protease. Um, so we decided, okay, um, let's, let's, let's do an explorative study um, to see if maybe some pathways pop up that we can relate at least to PAR1 or PAR2 activation, um, or maybe other pathways that are modulated. So what we actually did in our 14 and 20 week model, we did <coughs> an explorative RNA sequencing in our aortic arches. And I'm going to start off with our 14 week model. Um, so remember our 14 week model was um, one group 14 weeks, just a Western type diet, APOE background, and the other group was 14 week model treated with rebroxaban. Um, so we did this in uh, collaboration with Monica Stoll from Germany, who actually sequenced the, isolated the RNA and sequenced um, the aortic arches for us. Uh, we then got back a raw um, a count table, actually. <coughs> so we then further processes, processed this, this data. Um, and we started off by filtering out genes that had a lower count um, than five in at least two samples, just to, to clear off um, uh, the noise in the data, because that would definitely affect your power in the end. Um, so we started off with almost 33,000 genes, and after filtering out low counts, we ended up with 18,000 genes that we actually used in our analysis. Uh, we normalized them using 5,000 empirical probes. If we then look at our 14-week model at the principal component plot, you actually see that the rivaroxaban group and the, co the control group actually tends to cluster nicely together. And of course, there are some controls and rivaroxabans that uh, mice that look a little bit different. By the way, here in green, uh, with the R, depicted with R, that's the rivaroxaban group, and the orange, brownish colors, those are the control groups. Right. <clears throat> so, but, but, but you, you nicely see that they definitely cluster together. So that indeed means that your rivaroxaban treatment is doing something on the genetics, is doing something on the gene level. Um, changes the expression of genes. <clears throat> and that's just an anticoagulant. Um, so we ended up after uh, the analysis with uh, roughly 200 genes that are differ significantly differentially expressed um, after a p-adjustment of uh, below 0 0.1. <clears throat> and these are just examples of a few hits. Um, I must say we haven't had a chance to look at all these, these markers individually, um, but there are definitely a few interesting um, um, genes that pop up. Um, Adam TS1, for example, uh, ARID 5A, uh, which is known to influence uh, IL-6 messenger RNA levels. So there are definitely some interesting hits when you look at them individually. 
But what we've actually done to start with <coughs> is do some enrichment, go term enrichment analysis to actually see which pathways are actually now affected. So we did enrichment analysis uh, with the 200 genes that were significantly differentially expressed. And we looked at the biological processes that are actually influenced by, <coughs> by rebroxaban treatment. Um, so what you see here on the left, you see all these go terms, for example, carboxylic acid metabol metabolic processes, et cetera, and on the bottom lipid metabolic processes. Um, and what you see here is the percentage of genes that were actually differentially expressed in our data set that belonged to this specific go term. Um, the higher the dot, the more significant it is. <coughs> also means the, high, the, the more, uh, the darker the plot, the more significant the enrichment this pathway is in our data set. And again, here, of course, you see the thicker the dot, um, the more counts we, we have here in this, in this data set. And what you actually can appreciate here from these go term enrichment analysis, and that was actually for, to us a little bit of a surprise, is that we actually seem to modulate uh, processes that are actually involved in lipid metabolism. And of course, you would say atherosclerosis, it's, it, it's a lipid driven disease. So of course you would somehow influence your metabolism. Um, when we look at the literature where everyone actually talks about a decrease in inflammation, we would have actually expected to see that back here. Um, but there's, there's one difference. Um, when you look at the papers that actually look at inflammation, they only measure a few genes, a few proteins, um, maybe five. So they only have to correct for five proteins. We have to correct for 18,000 proteins so that, that very much changes your power, of course. <coughs> um, and for example, if we look at individual genes, um, for example, the TNF families or interleukins, we definitely see differences between the rebroxaban group and um, the control group. Again, suggesting that, it, that rebroxaban definitely also affects your inflammation, but we just don't have enough power to show that. Um, and it also means that, of course, lipid metabolism might be even more important in the phenotype that we see. And that is something that we think is very interesting um, and we really have to dive in further. Okay, and what about our 20 week model where we saw some regression going on in the carotids? Um, <coughs> also in this model, um, um, we filtered out genes that had a lower count than five in at least two samples. And again, we used normalization strategies that used 5,000 empirical controls. Um, in this data set, we ended up with a few less genes, um, but still over 17,000 genes that we, uh, in, that we run an analysis on. <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so this is actually the this is the principal component plot of our 20-week model. And you already see that there's some, some more variation um, um, in our mice when you compare them to our 14-week model. And so it's, it's a different model. I mean, um, these mice had um, a Western-type diet for 14 weeks, so they all had tremendous amounts of, of atherosclerosis, and then we treated these mice with only six weeks of rebroxaban. So that might already explain some of the variation that we see here compared to our 14 week model. But still, we ended up with 30 different, significantly differentially expressed genes in this data set. Um, and also here, <coughs> I must say, we haven't had a chance to look at them individually. Um, but there are also, again, definitely some interesting um, uh, <coughs> uh, genes coming up. Um, I mean, we, for example, we know that macrophages play a very large role in regression of atherosclerosis. Um, and you can then appreciate that, for example, we get AT, ATF5 popping up as one of the top hits. And that's actually transcription factor that is involved in polarizing macrophages. So maybe that's another angle we could take here. Um, but again, we still have to look at all these, these genes individually. 
Um, I haven't done um, go term enrichment analysis because 30, 30 genes um, is, is, is quite a low number uh, to run uh, go term enrichment analysis. Of course, I did run them, um, but not much came out of that. We just lacked uh, power here in this model, in our, 40, in our 20 weeks model. Um, <coughs> So to summarize actually the first part uh, with help of this figure, so I started off by, um, by explaining that the coagulation cascade can affect inflammation via multiple routes. And still, again, this is a simplified scheme, um, but this is our working hypothesis. I mean, we, we humans tend to make things easier than it, than it is, of course, or to grasp it. Um, <clears throat> so what we've done is we treated our mice with rivaroxaban, and in the end, we saw a beneficial phenotype on, um, on atherosclerosis. At the moment, we haven't showed yet that it also affects the protein levels of inflammation. Uh, we're still scheduling to do that. Um, but what we do found in our RNA sequencing data is that somehow, by inhibiting our uh, factor 10A, we somehow affected metabolic processes. And then the question is, okay, but, but how? Well, there is one nature paper from uh, a few years back who actually showed that part two might also influence uh, metabolism. So that would maybe one angle here uh, that we could take to further elucidate um, how the metabolic process is actually uh, being influenced by uh, factor 10A inhibition. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so to wrap the first part up, um, I showed you that, uh, but, that we, but also others, uh, were able to attenuate atherosclerosis in mice um, uh, treated with rivaroxaban. Um, it even stabilized the plaque, but it also decreased inflammation in the hands of, uh, of, of our colleagues. Um, it, in our hands, it even seemed to promote regression of already developed plaques. And even more interestingly, uh, Rivaroxaban seems to modulate pathways that are involved in fatty acid metabolism. <clears throat> okay, so what's still to come? Um, we're still finalizing our uh, 14 and 20 week model. Um, of course, it, it, it has been delayed due to the, to, due to the circumstances at the moment, um, but we're still gonna measure um, inflammatory, sorry, inflammatory markers um, in our plasma, from uh, in both our 14 and 20 week model using the O-Link platform in, co in collaboration with Professor Hoop and uh, Romina Walsh, a PhD student. Um, <coughs> and we're gonna further look at um, inflammatory proteins in both the plasma and in um, aortic hom homogenates using our Luminex multiplex system. Um, and then of course, because I also told you that um, more roots actually lead to inflammation and when you inhibit factor 10A. We, we, can def we cannot rule out actually our platelets. Um, so that's why we also initiated um, or set up a collaboration uh, with Professor Mockman, Dr. Owers Owens, and uh, their postdoc Stephen Grover, where we actually look at how dual pathway inhibition, so factor 10A inhibition and platelet inhibition combined how that actually affects the phenotype in uh, these mice. <laughs> and um, probably we, we will have that data in the upcoming uh, months if everything uh, passes. Um, and I also told you that a regular PAR1 or PAR2 knockout actually does not help us a lot when interpreting the results we have. Um, we really have to go to more sophisticated uh, PAR mutants, uh, mutants that are, for example, resistant to only factor 10A activation or only thrombin activation. And that's something that we are um, doing together with uh, Professor Hoof and Romina, and Romina Wolz. <clears throat> okay, so... Now let's start with uh, the second topic of today, myocardial infarction. It's a, it's a little bit smaller than, uh, than the atherosclerosis part, but still highly interesting. <clears throat> okay, so, <coughs> so this is data from 10 years back in our lab, before my time actually, and um, they looked at 
how the APC PAR1 signaling, uh, so activated protein C, which is um, 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 an anticoagulant, um, <clears throat> physiological anticoagulant that inhibits your coagulation cascade, but is also able to activate PAR1. Um, so they looked at the relation of activated protein C, PAR1 signaling in myocardial ischemia reperfusion. And what they showed indeed is that when you inject uh, APC, which is considered um, um, protective through PAR1, you indeed see that um, the area of infarction goes down after APC treatment compared to control. And interestingly, when you just use a regular anticoagulant that has no effect on PAR1 or PAR2 activation, they actually lose the effect. And that's depicted here. And when you then combine a PAR1 knockout, um, the target of activated protein C, and you combine that with uh, activated protein C injections, you actually see that you also lose the effect. Indeed, showing that the APC PAR1 pathway is definitely involved in the protective effect that uh, Sarah Lubele uh, saw some years back. And she's also done this with ACES, active site uh, factor 7 inhibitor, which actually shows a similar result um, as the APC. Again, suggesting that PAR1 and PAR2 is involved because also um, uh, tissue factor factor 7A is able to directly activate your PARs, but also through, of course, factor 10A um, and thrombin, which is downstream of tissue factor factor 7A. So this all suggests also in this pathology that the coagulation system uh, plays a nice role. <coughs> so, and we actually followed up on this work by looking at, okay, what, what does redox ban do in this model? Um, so for this, we again have three models um, um, so we have a one hour ischemia period, a four hour reperfusion uh, phase, or a 24 hours reperfusion phase, or for the long term, a four weeks reperfusion phase. And what's actually different from, uh, in this model from the models that traditionally are being used for uh, myocardial ischemia reperfusion model is that this is a closed chest model. So that means that seven days prior to our exp experiment, we already put a like, uh, we already um, put a ligature around the LAD, or we don't tighten it yet. Um, because traditionally what people do, they just open the chest, they induce ischemia, and they induce reperfusion. But you can of course imagine that when a mouse has his chest wide open, it, it induces a massive um, uh, inflammatory response, maybe even affecting the results. So we chose a closed chest model because we know after seven days, the inflammatory response is gone. So we have a quite clean model in this case. Um, we treated these mice with two injections of rivaroxaban. Um, 15 minutes after the induction of ischemia um, and, and the second one, five minutes after the induction of reperfusion. And we then measured the area of infarction over the area at risk. <coughs> <clears throat> so what we actually do here, you see indeed the site where we ligate uh, the LED. Um, of course, you then get an infarction uh, downstream of that vessel, um, where you see indeed here in red the area of infarction and the actual dead cells, the area um, or the area at risk in red and the area of infarction indeed um, in pale white. Um, we, we cut the, this, the heart in slices of 0.6 millimeters and we then stain it with a TTC staining. And the TTC staining actually differentiates between viable tissue and non-viable tissue. And that's what you see here. <coughs> so here you nicely see in red the area um, at risk. And here you so and here you see because it's it's red. So it's viable tissue, and here you nicely see in white, pale, the dead tissue. And that is just a ratio that we use to, um, to look at the effect of rebroxaban treatment. And what we then saw is indeed that after four hours of reperfusion phase, and also after 24 hours of reperfusion phase with just two injections of rebroxaban, we indeed were able to protect the heart 
Um, so we attenuated the infarcted area. Um, <coughs> so that's already nice. But what about four weeks? Does it also have an effect after four weeks, just two boluses of rivaroxaban? Well, we're still finalizing the data, uh, but this definitely shows us a trend also after four weeks towards pro the protective effects of rivaroxaban. So something in the early phase is happening with the coagulation cascade that further aggravates the damage. And can that be inflammation? Um, yes, definitely. <clears throat> Okay, so what we're further doing in this project is um, we're gonna measure the inflammatory markers in the plasma and in the left ventricle homogenates, again, using the Luminex multiplex system. Um, and here we're gonna use, uh, also we're gonna study um, um, the role of the coagulation cascade by using PAR mutants in collaboration with Professor Hoof, Professor Wenzel and Michael Mulliter. <clears throat> um, and I must say, um, <clears throat> We've already tested one uh, part two mutant, a mutant that is actually resistant to factor 10A activation. And we actually got the same phenotype as our rivaroxaban pre treatment. So this really shows that factor 10A indeed does, does the trick here. <coughs> of course, also here in this model, we cannot rule out platelets. Um, so for that, we um, have a collaboration with Professor uh, Antonian van Zonneveld, uh, Dr. Hattie de Boer, and uh, their PhD student, Sophie Dolleman, where we look at the contribution of platelets. And this is just one of the figures that we, uh, that we, um, that we took, where you nicely see um, endothelial cells in, in bluish, um, <clears throat> and you see uh, fibrinogen in green, and you see the platelets in red, and you nicely see here a platelet plot. Um, but I, can, I cannot show you, unfortunately, more data. Um, at this moment. Okay, um, so then our um, last part, atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> oh, one second. Atrial fibrillation. So just briefly, atrial fibrillation is actually an abnormal beating of the heart. So here you see a healthy heart where you nicely see that the signal starts in a sinus node, nicely being conveyed to the rest of the heart, and you just get a regular beating. <clears throat> However, during atrial fibrillation, you get a lot of ectopic initiation of signaling inside the atria. And sporadically, the signal also gets passed, sorry, it gets passed through, leading to this irregular and rapid beating of the heart. And what you have to consider is that almost 3% of the population is affected by atrial fibrillation. And what's even more relevant is that when you are affected by atrial fibrillation, you actually have a five-fold increased risk of getting a stroke or a two-fold increased risk of death. So it's really a relevant uh, disease that we have to look into. <clears throat> um, so based on literature, what, what do we know about atrial fibrillation and the coagulation system? <clears throat> of course, it's also being evident from the stroke risk. Um, but we see that indeed atrial fibrillation promotes hypercoagulability, which in the, indeed explains the stroke risk. Um, but when you think about the other things I've told you that the coagulation system also affects uh, the inflammation, uh, the inflammatory system. And when you know that inflammation also leads to fibrosis, which is a substrate for atrial fibrillation, you might also turn it around. So that means indeed that when you have atrial fibrillation, you have hypercoagulability. But when you have hypercoagulability, does that mean that you have a substrate for atrial fibrillation? Um, <clears throat> and I can tell you, well, that probably is the case. This is, of course, based on animal work done by our group. Um, published uh, three years ago and what they actually did here is they looked at a wild type mouse <coughs> they paced this mouse for a few for a few seconds and then afterwards they stopped and they saw okay here when we paste them we of course um, induce atrial fibrillation because we manually paste the mouse and then afterwards when we stop a wild type mouse immediately goes back to a normal sinus rhythm so it's not prone to develop atrial fibrillation. Um, but what happens if we do this in a mouse that's actually hypercoagulable? That's what they did, that they used TMPRO Pro mouse, which is a hypercoagulable mouse because it has a mutation in the, in the thrombomodulin gene. And, oh, 
And also here, they paste this mouse. And in contrast to what happens to the wild type mouse, this mouse actually stays for some seconds in atrial fibrillation. So indeed, a hypercoagulable state is indeed somehow a substrate for atrial fibrillation. <coughs> um, and that's also depicted here in this graph, and also here where you see um, the duration of AF, you again see that in this hypercoagulable mouse, the duration of AF is way longer um, compared to our wild type mouse, where, where only one mouse actually suffers from for one second uh, for atrial fibrillation. Um, and this actually set the basis for a large consortium um, in our country, where um, a few groups in Maastricht are also part of, and that's actually the RACE-5 uh, Sivum consortium. And in this consort consortium, in Maastricht at least, um, we look at, uh, this is Billy Scoff, which is in, also a PhD student working on this, and he looks at um, the influence of factor 10A inhibition on atrial fibrillation in a GOAT model. Um, re really interesting model, um, and hopefully he will, uh, he will uh, have some data, some nice data soon. Um, and this is Elisa D'Alessandro, and she's actually looking at the mechanisms behind um, the relationship of hypercoagulability and AF inducibility. And again, here our hypothesis is that somehow the PARs are involved indeed in this inflammatory fibrotic process. And she looks at cell, she uses cell culture studies to look at this, uh, mainly fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes. Which, all, which also express bar receptors. Um, we also have a clinical study uh, where I'm involved in, where we look at markers <coughs> of coagulability in AF patients. Um, and for that, we include 700, we, have, we are still in, in the inclusion phase, but we, in the end, we aim for 750 patients with self-terminating AF. Um, these patients don't have an anticoagulant on board. I will later on show you why. Um, we will continuously measure their uh, rhythm for two years, and uh, the primary endpoints include um, progression towards non-self-terminating AF or MACE. Um, and then we sample blood at baseline. <coughs> so we sample blood at baseline and after two years. And what I think is really interesting is that we also get a chance to, um, to draw blood during ablation. So we actually go in to the atria where we can collect uh, blood locally. And we do that before and 15 minutes after ablation, um, both in the atria locally, locally but, <coughs> but also in the femoral veins uh, peripherally. <clears throat> to see whether there are indeed differences between local activation of coagulation or systemic activation. And these are then the markers uh, that we're going to measure. Uh, these are homemade uh, ELISAs uh, of all the coagulation factors, or most of the coagulation factors, actually. Um, at the moment, we're also um, putting these in our Luminex multiplex assay. Um, hopefully, they will be done uh, maybe next year. Um, <coughs> because that allows us to measure all these markers at one with just a few microliters of plasma. So that would be really cool. Um, I cannot show you results yet from this study because I told you we're still in the inclusion phase, but I can give you something else because a few years back, um, our group has already done a small pilot um, in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, these were very young patients who, had, who have atrial fibrillation uh, without any comorbidities. So that also means that they don't take any anticoagulants because their stroke risk, as you will see in the upcoming slides, is really low. <clears throat> and what they actually found is <coughs> in these uh, young uh, lone AF patients without a DOAC, so without any comorbidities, that already factor nine levels were increased, suggesting that although they are quite healthy, they do already have a pre-thrombotic state. <clears throat> um, and then you can think about the previous data that I've showed you about the relation between coagulation um, and inflammation and being uh, a substrate for, for the progression of atrial fibrillation. 
Um, we might even con should consider whether we should already treat also these patients um, um, who had this pre-thrombotic state already with anticoagulants, because at the moment we're not treating them because the, the stroke risk is just too low. <clears throat> so it does not outweigh the, 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 um, the bleeding risk. <clears throat> so <clears throat> why do these patients don't get any anticoagulants? Well, that's actually based <clears throat> on their stroke risk. So for that, we have a chat fast score. Um, and for all the risk factors, these patients get either one or two points. So hypertension, for example, gives you one point. Um, age between 65 and 74 gives you an, an additional point. And I'm sorry, ladies, but also being a female also gives you already one point. And that's then what's depicted here. When you then uh, take the sum of these points, you end up with a stroke risk per year. Um, and as soon as you have um, a score of two and higher, you're actually um, being put on rivaroxaban treatment to reduce your stroke risk. But indeed, maybe we should indeed start the discussion or at least look into this, whether, we, whether these patients would maybe also um, um, have some be beneficial effects of, of rivaroxaban treatment. Um, <clears throat> definitely when you consider that a hypercoagulable state might already be a substrate for the progression of atrial fibrillation. So maybe we can prevent or delay this progression. <clears throat> um, of course, here I mentioned rivaroxaban, but it, it can be a pixaban, which is also a factor 10A inhibitor. It can be the bigotran, a, a, a thrombin inhibitor, even vitamin K antagonists are uh, still used uh, to treat these patients. <coughs> okay. Um, but this is actually not the only indication um, where patients are receiving um, uh, rivaroxaban. Um, so rivaroxaban is, is ranges in doses of in tablet form between 2.5 and 20 milligrams. And you already saw that patients with atrial fibrillation get the highest dose, 20 milligram per tablet. Um, but we also give these, these drugs to um, um, people who are uh, undergoing a knee or a hip surgery and have a restricted mobility for a longer period and are at risk for DVT. So we give them 10 milligrams um, per day of rivaroxaban just to prevent a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. Um, but also people who already have a DVT or a pulmonary embolism or can be treated with rivaroxaban, uh, ranging from 15 to 20 milligram. And when they have a high recurrence rate um, or chance of a, 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 high re of a, a high chance of recurrences, they can also be treated for, um, with rivaroxaban for the long term. And, Actually, also in these patients, the, quest the question arises based on animal work is, okay, we, we anticoagulate these people because we want to prevent uh, thrombosis in, the, in these patients. But from animal work, we, we know that if we inhibit coagulation, we're not only inhibiting thrombus formation, but we kind of vascular protect these, these animals. And I think it's very interesting to raise the question whether we also um, <clears throat> whether these patients who are treated with rivaroxaban also have some kind of vascular protection as a beneficial side effect of the drug. And um, then the question is, do we already have some kind of clinical data that actually supports the hypothesis that we can translate the animal work towards humans? <clears throat> well, um, maybe. Um, <clears throat> But we're, we're definitely not there. But, but let me show you a study that might indeed suggest that we can, um, um, that we potentially indeed have some vascular protective effects in, in humans treated with rivaroxaban. <coughs> so this is the COMPASS trial. Probably most of you have seen this already. Um, this is a very large trial with patients who have stable atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease. And they were treated with either aspirin, uh, five milligrams, B-daily rivaroxaban, or the combination of aspirin and a very low dose of rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram B-daily. And they looked at the primary composite outcome stroke, myocardial infarction, and cardiovascular death. Um, <coughs> and what they actually 
found is when you treat patients with either Rivrox, uh, with either Rivroxaban or aspirin as monotherapy, there's actually not much of a difference between the two. However, when you then use aspirin and put a very low dose of Rivroxaban on top of your aspirin treatment, so we're now using dual pathway inhibition in these patients, we actually have a beneficial effect over monotherapy, indeed suggesting that um, <clears throat> maybe this, this additive Rivroxaban does have an atroprotective effect in these patients. Um, but that's, of course, something that we uh, have to dive in further uh, in the future. And of course, Rivroxaban definitely also adds an additional antithrombotic um, effect. But it's still very tempting to speculate that also in these patients, maybe Rivroxaban also is vascular protective. Um, so to sum everything up, <clears throat> so I started off with this very simplified scheme. And I showed you that when we inhibit rivroxaban in mouse models of disease, uh, atherosclerosis, for example, myocardial infarction, we indeed um, um, have a beneficial phenotype. <coughs> so we indeed also decrease inflammation. Um, we still don't know how it works exactly. We know that if we take out PAR1 and PAR2, that we get a similar effect. Um, but how that exactly works, um, well, we still have to um, um, elucidate that further. Um, <coughs> but at least what the COMPASS trial indeed does is it inhibits uh, rivroxaban, it inhibits factor 10 at, the rivro um, at this level with rivroxaban, and it inhibits platelets at that level. Um, so it would also really be interesting to see whether indeed the inflammatory markers in these patients treated with the combination actually go down indeed compared to, for example, monotherapy. Um, and we also know that there's a tight link between inflammation and coagulation. So then we indeed are, are, are triggering or inhibiting the system at mul multiple sites. Um, may, <clears throat> and hopefully that will, in the end, um, um, could lead uh, so, so we're triggering. Sorry, we're triggering the system at multiple sites, and hopefully, in the end, if we further look into this, um, we can maybe come up with even a more specified um, um, therapy. And what I've also showed you, and that's even more interesting, is um, what about metabolic processes? How does rivaroxaban inhibit or modulate these metabolic processes? And, and I think that's also a, a very interesting question that we have to address in the upcoming years. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, and I want to thank all these people that have contributed uh, to the work, and specifically Hugo Tenkata and Henry Sponk, uh, my two supervisors that have been supporting me actually from the moment I arrived there. Um, and before I forget, if you have any suggestions or comments, um, this is on the bottom, you, you see my email address. Um, so please, please email me if you have any, uh, any comments or, uh, or other options. Um, and for, I think we're now heading to the questions. <clears throat> yes, we will. Thank you so much. Also, are you okay? Well, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> We're worried about your health, but that was a phenomenal talk. Are you a postdoc now? No, I'm a PhD. I was, that's in, like very impressive. Very, very impressive. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have some questions, but also you used the full hour, which is totally fine. You had a lot to say and it was really great. Um, so maybe we could just take one or two quickly, but I will send Jens the rest of the questions and um, he could, you know, write back to you the answers. Um, so, I mean, I can read this one from Daphna. She says, mouse platelets don't express PAR1, thrombin activates platelets via PAR4. Is there anything known about the role of PAR4 in cardiovascular diseases? <coughs> um, uh, that, that's, that's indeed true. Um, so, we, we, we can't forget indeed that, of course, a mouse is different um, uh, than humans. And you're right. Um, if we look at human platelets indeed, um, 
HAL1 uh, is the main uh, activating receptor in humans. Uh, and then we, the, the, the human um, uh, platelet also has part 4 And that's di slightly different than uh, mice, where uh, the part 3 and part 4 receptor are indeed the main receptors. Um, whether there is something known about part 4 in, in humans, I, I can recall um, a paper from a, years, from a few years back um, where they looked, I think, in Afro-Americans, where they looked at um, um, a sort of SNP inside the gene. And I think that was associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular health. Yeah, Paul Bray uh, and Len Edelstein's work. Yeah, but it, it's a few years back, and I, I haven't seen the paper in a few years now. Um, but it's, it's definitely associated with a, with a higher uh, thrombotic incidence, if I'm correct. Yes. All right, so we're going to let you go get a throat lozenge and a drink and maybe some beer. You did a great job. And I think you were a first PhD student, like really could have been a faculty talk. So congratulations and congratulations on all this work and all the really great stuff going on in March. <laughs> it's beautiful. So what I'm going to do now is just demote you and I'm going to bring up our first trainee talk. So please, 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 everybody um, stick around. Um, Fabienne, I think I'm saying that right. Sounds like a very beautiful name is going to present now. I'm finding you. Stop.